Number six, invasion of boring. A communications disruption can mean only one thing, invasion. It can also mean that you didn't pay your phone bill. So that never seemed to be on the case about this thing. The old guy seems to know what's going on. And although they are a peaceful people with no army, this asshole seems to be an expert in the process of planetary invasions. So what exactly is the purpose of this invasion? It's almost like after Lucas wrote the invasion scene, You didn't really know what to do next? How did George not know what to do next when after this very scene, the invasion happens in other films they have bad guys get ambushed or something along those lines and communications get cut off usually during this time the bad guys are notified or good guys in this case were notified of a communication disruption which can only mean one thing, an ambush or invasion. Also, the scene afterwards, the Battle of Naboo Thief, this excellent, well-directed, well-shot battle with some great scenes and dialogue that's actually intelligent and interesting. So he thought he'd make the Queen have to sign a treaty to make the invasion legal. I mean, why not? First of all, forcing someone to sign a treaty sort of contradicts the purpose of a signature on a treaty. You might as well just forge it if you're gonna make her sign it. That's the point. They're bad guys, genius. Of course they'll force her to sign. Anyway, they don't care. They want that planet. That's all they care about. And that is shown throughout the film. So that is not a contradiction. So meanwhile, Qui-Gon, Booz, and Obi-Wan are in the underwater city. Qui-Gon is still talking about warning the Naboo that they're about to be attacked, when he really doesn't know that they're actually going to attack them. A droid army is about to attack the Naboo. Then since Qui-Gon is jumping to conclusions and making shit up, Obi-Wan starts doing it too. Once those droids take control of the surface, they will take control of you. First of all, the only thing that the Jedi's know at this point is that they were sent to settle a trivial dispute about taxing trade routes. All of a sudden, Obi-Wan thinks he knows the entire plan of the Trade Federation. All the Jedi know at this point is that they were sent to settle a dispute, right? But things got complicated after that. Remember, the droid army was there, and they were dangerous droids on the planet, so they had to improvise and think. Also, they have to warn the Senate of Naboo. Well, it's like Qui-Gon Jinn said, there's always a bigger fish. If you decide to take the land, you're going to take water, oil, and materials too. That's just a given when you're invaded. How does he know they plan to take control of the surface and the underwater city too? Maybe they just want to steal some kind of priceless artifact from the Naboo. Maybe the Naboo did some kind of horrific act against the Trade Federation and they're just getting some revenge. You and the Naboo form a symbiont circle. What happens to one of you will affect the other. You must understand this. Now what does that even mean? What happens to one of you will affect the other. So if the land is affected, so will deep under the water. That's what Obi-Wan is saying, and you made it like he blundered when you blundered because you were the one who didn't even understand something quite simple. What happens to one will affect the other. Black, are you dumb? How is a totally isolated city underwater affected at all by the Navu being attacked by droids on the complete other side of the planet? Yes, I said the other side of the planet because... The speediest way to the Navu is going through the planet core. By planet core, I assume he means planet core, like the center. Usually that's what a core is. So they spend two hours flying deeper and deeper into the planet underwater. I guess to emerge on the other side of the planet, I guess? This begs the question, why did the droid armies land on the other side of the planet where the Gunga City is? If they expected no opposition, why land in the middle of forests and spend time chopping through the woods so far away from your target? You can barely land anywhere. There's a bunch of monuments all over the place. You definitely destroy monuments, cities, when those huge ships land. There goes those treaties. They want this to look as legal as possible, even though it isn't. That's what they're doing, making it seem as legal as possible. Why not just land right outside the city? Or in the city? Anyways... So like idiots, they surfaced the bongo right in the middle of an occupied city in broad daylight. And then Ginny just looks around without any attempt at subterfuge. Ginny? Stop calling him that. What? What the fuck? Inside the city, Queen of Manalan has been captured by the green guys. But instead of forcing her to sign the treaty right then and there, 
or keeping her locked up inside the big capitol building under heavy guard, they inexplicably send her away from them. Commander. Yes, sir. Process them. They send them away from them. Dude, did you not hear what he said? He says process them. So that means they're being processed because they're taking over. Remember, this is the most important person in their whole plan, and they send her to be processed in some place called Camp 4. Captain, take them to Camp 4. Roger, roger. Oh, but at least they remembered to send her with a whopping eight battle droids to protect her from the two Jedis that they just discussed they had not found yet. You didn't tell him about the missing Jedi. No need to report that to him until we have something to report. They won't report unless they have something to report showing that the mystery man, aka Palpatine, is serious about failure and probably doesn't tolerate it, which you can infer from just the scene alone. But don't worry, these battle droids have proven very effective against Jedi Knights. Oh, wait. Oh wait, they sent stronger droids after them, when that didn't work, so your point is invalid. No. You know, it really adds a lot of tension in the movie when the main enemy forces are totally ineffective. There are too many of them. It won't be a problem. Oh, it shouldn't be a problem. Oh, now I'm really on the edge of my seat. It shouldn't be a problem. That's enough. You haven't even proved these are actual flaws with the plot and narrative. You nitpick some pointless stuff about things that don't even have an effect on the overall plot. Then you nitpick the droids and said they weren't effective. So, why would they send them after them, not realizing they sent even stronger droids like Jordica's as well? So if they send stronger droids, your point is invalid, so that edge of my seat joke is foolish. You know, Jedi cut them down like they're butter, and they really are pretty useless. Fuck you. Fuck you to George Lucas. Have you lost your fucking mind? What the fuck is your problem? What the fuck? You're being a jerk for no reason. Chill the fuck out. These guys have no respect for George whatsoever, it's so insane. You know you're exaggerating, you drama queen. Number seven, escape from the planet of boring. Okay, so they free the Nabu Air Force, and then they get on a silver jet thing to run through a blockade. Which again, I remind you, the point of a blockade is to stop ships from getting through. So Qui-Gon Jinn could have very easily gotten everyone killed. Does anyone smell gin? Hey. It's 11.30 in the morning. Who's been drinking? No one's really that nervous about running this blockade until the shield generator gets hit. Shabams! Blammo! Shabams! Shield generator's been hit! Ooh, then suddenly it's dangerous. The shield generator being hit? What? It was already dangerous from the beginning. They just mentioned the fact that the shields have been hit. They never nullified the level of danger about the situation at all. So you made a false claim there, and the scene is just fine. Everything that's established is in the scene, the blockade is around, they are shooting at the protagonist of the story, they need to get around the blockade, and they can't fight it, they can only escape it. So everything you need to know is already established in the scene, so leave it alone. How does the shield generator get hit, even when the shields are still up? It's a dumbass question. When you play Star Wars Battlefront, you knock down the shields by shooting at the ship, you can shoot directly at what's putting the shield up. In other words, if someone shoots your ship enough, the shields go down. Here's the reason, because of the shield generator. Someone shoots it, the shields will go down. Someone shoots your ships enough, even with shields up, the shields go down. Stick to Star Trek, champ. You're better off there. Hey, wait. Just like knowing what kind of deadly gas it is before you smell it, how does the shield generator get hit while the shields are up? Shouldn't it? Ah, oh, fuck it. If we can't get the shield generator fixed, we'll be sitting ducks. Wait, slow down, asshole. Don't call him an asshole, genius. You're the one that made a mistake. Complaining about shields. Get out of here. Tch, some of the dumbest criticisms. Really? Shields? That's your criticism right now? Shields? You're sitting ducks without a shield generator because your shield can go down. You're complaining because the shield generator allows for a person to not be a sitting duck and even can get through the blockade? Isn't that a good thing? The fact that you have a shield generator which will keep you safe when you're in danger. I fail to see how this is a problem in the story. This is some intelligent storytelling. They considered the shield, they considered the blockade, so they're considering not only story, but even the logistics. Everything anyone says in this movie makes no sense, so I have to keep up here, okay? Stop. Your shields are gone. Okay, wait. We're losing droids fast. Hey, here. Wait. Keep out of trouble. Hold on a minute. L the Hold on. Shield generator fixed. We'll be sitting ducks. Okay, wait. How will you be sitting ducks without a shield generator? 
are you implying that with the shield generator you wouldn't be sitting ducks? That you would be able to breeze through this blockade somehow? Doesn't that defeat the purpose of a blockade if any ship with an operational shield generator would suddenly not be a sitting duck and could go through the blockade? I would think that with Trade Federation ships of that size and quantity, you'd get blown to fucking pieces with or without shields if they all fired on you? What you brought up, when you brought up if they all fired at you, not if you escape the blockade, plus you have shields, before they even get a chance to fire at you all at the same time. So anyways, R2-D2 sticks a thing in a thing and fixes the shield generator. Then the dude says, Deflect the shields up at maximum. Okay, so then that suddenly relieves all the tension in the scene and allows them to escape the blockade. If you'll notice though, after the shields are back up at maximum, they don't get hit again. So really, R2 fixing the shield generator did nothing at all. M maybe it gave them the confidence to escape? So then after they show no emotion at all about the droids being picked off one by one. We're losing droids fast. No emotion at all. He is just a Jedi monk trained to control his emotions. So when he responded, he was emotional. However, since he trained himself for so long to detach from emotion, it didn't come out in the way you wanted it to, but it came out the way it should for a detached Jedi monk. They inexplicably send R2 up to the queen to get a pat on the head, I guess. She thanks the little piece of equipment like it's a person. Hey, nobody thanked the ship. I think that did a lot more to help him escape. Thank you, R2-D2. You see, normal people don't think of droids as people. Even the kind-hearted Luke Skywalker reacts with sarcasm when introducing himself to R2-D2. And this is my counterpart, R2-D2. Hello. Would a queen really thank a droid? Oh, maybe. Again, this is a film for babies. She thanks the droid like it's a person. That's because R2-D2 saved their lives. He saved lives in the original trilogy. Lives. Years. He saved lives years ago. Two. So he was rewarded for it. Notice how R2-D2 has an identity in the original trilogy? This is why he was a droid of the Naboo Guard. He eventually became the Queen's personal droid due to his heroic actions. In the Star Wars universe, yes, droids are considered droids. But people like Luke speak to them and consider them a friend. So there is a sense of some form of self-awareness in droids in Star Wars. This is why people have fallen in love with droids in Star Wars in comparison to robots in other creative mediums. Right, at first Luke reacted with sarcasm, but look at Empire Strikes Back. Look at how Luke talks to R2-D2, like he's a person, because he's getting more used to him. Look at Return of the Jedi, he was happy to see C-3PO and R2-D2 and he spoke to them like people so the point still stands you're still on that would a queen thank a droid he was a droid of the royal naboo guard then he became the personal droid of the queen due to his heroic actions this is why you see r2d2 and the protagonist of star wars because he's no ordinary droid he has a sarcastic personality in the original trilogy and in the prequels, if you pay attention to the context clues, when he speaks to C-3PO, C-3PO gets mad at his sarcastic remarks, and they butt heads all the time. The only way to butt heads with someone, or some form of AI or robotic entity, is to have a personality. And that means you're not just a droid if you can exhibit personality traits. She orders him to clean the droid because she sees him as a prized possession now. Then it will act on the invasion. Chance of Valorum seems to think there is hope. If I may say so, you'll not just say the chance I have. Wait, I gotta get this straight here. Hold on. So, at this point, the queen in the middle that's wearing black is the decoy, but the real queen is Padme, is in the orange. Right? Okay. So the handmaiden decoy then orders the queen to go clean the droid? Clean this droid up as best you can. It deserves our gratitude. And it deserves our gratitude. That's what he stated. It deserves our gratitude for his heroic actions saving them during the blockade. Again, I reiterate, the main character of this movie is Qui-Gon Jinn. Did Amidalan ask to be sent off on a menial task prior to this so she could have a scene where she meets Jar Jar Binks? You'd think the real queen would want to hang out in the throne room area to stay current on any updates about what's going on? And why did they even bring a dirty droid up to the queen? Did they really think that a member of royalty was going to care that a droid fixed something and then personally thank it? So maybe the queen and the handmaiden, it's like a little game that they play, you know? When I'm the queen, I'm going to have you go clean toilets. <laughs> when I'm the queen, 
I'm gonna have you die for me in a horrible explosion! Oh, wait. That happened. I'm so sorry. Number eight, I'm gonna slit my wrist. It's hard to stomach any more of this shit. I still don't know who the main character is and why we should care about any of this. At around this point in the original Star Wars movie, we've been with Luke almost the whole time getting to know him. We see his plight, his hopes and dreams, we feel his frustration, and then his sadness. The slow build-up added depth and emotion and anticipation for the story to expand. In The Phantom Menace, we have nothing. We have a monotone queen who's hiding from signing a tree that's supposed to do something. Why in fuck's name should we care at all? I don't care about any of these characters. And to top that, we constantly have to question every single action that's taken by Qui-Gon, the wise Jedi. Man, that's emotionally manipulative. I mean, you know how much people love the original trilogy and what it did for the world and storytelling. And you use this to put down the prequels. Why can't you appreciate both knowing they both complement each other? It wasn't just Luke that had storytelling. Anakin started off as a naive slave boy, then rebellious teen, then a more mature adult, and you saw this change throughout each film. And it had its own unique story arc behind it. There's so many profound moments in A Phantom Menace. There's always a bigger fish. The scene where Watto speaks to Qui-Gon. What do you think? You're some kind of Jedi waving your hand around like that? You can't stop the change any more than you can stop the suns from setting. I was not elected to watch my people suffer and die while you discuss this invasion in a committee. The ability to speak does not make you intelligent. Man, all these quotes, these scenes, the meaning that they have for the story and the plot, realizing that her son is changing and they can't stop it. He's going to grow up as a force user and he's not just any force user. He's the chosen one, realizing that the committee is not make, taking matters into the, realizing that the committee is not taking matters into their own hands, discussing even questioning the validity of this invasion for this blockade. So she has to. The Battle of Naboo Thee with Qui-Gon, Padme, and Obi-Wan. There's even more too. If you'd just give it a fair shot and pay close attention for one second, instead of having the slurish speeches about the original trilogy and going on and on about the purity and the holy sanctum of those movies, those films aren't perfect, you know, and it's great that we have them. However, we gotta respect other aspects of Star Wars too, not just one. And with that, I'll leave it at this. This was Tarragon, and I'm refuting Plinkett's claims about the prequels. Thank you for watching.